yeah, I'll, I'll get with you after. <laughs> and welcome to our virtual Bible study. This is our week two of our virtual Bible study where we've been studying the emotions, many of the emotions that we go through, and how many of you know that God is bigger than our emotions? A couple of weeks ago, we talked about anger and how oftentimes our um, anger is triggered by different things that happen in our life, but God is even able to deal with our anger. And so we're going to continue the discussion with two fantastic teachers of the Word of God. And so before I get out of the way and allow them to teach the Word, I want you to do me a favor. Hit that share button if you're watching on Facebook right now, or if you're watching on our website, go ahead and share that website with somebody else. Let's share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so first up, we have Minister Kelso, who's going to be talking to us about frustration, but let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, how we thank you when you honor you, Father God, for what you're about to do in this place, Father God. We pray, Lord, that you would touch the woman of God, Lord, as she prepares to stand and teach, Father God. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God that cares about our emotions, Father God. And Lord, you're bigger than our emotions, Father God. We pray, Lord, that you would have your way, Lord, that we will be inspired by the word of God, that we will be inspired by what's said on today, Lord. And if somebody, under the sound of my voice, Father God, somebody who is watching this in live or on demand, Father God, hears this gospel message, Father God, it does not know your darling son, Jesus Christ, in the pardon of their sins, Father God, that they will choose this day to come into an agreement with who God is and the fact that he is the savior of our lives, Father God. Lord, we thank you, we honor you, in Jesus' name we pray and ask it all, amen. And so if you're watching on Facebook right now, would you do me a favor and type in that comment section, teach the word, Minister Kelso, amen. Amen. Good evening, St. John family and friends, and as was stated earlier, welcome to our virtual Bible study. We are so happy to have you join us on today. So right now, I would like for you, if you have your word handy, would you turn to it, please? I will be reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, and the verses are 24 through 27. I'm going to be reading this from the New King James Version, and the Word of God says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was the fall. Father, we come to you this day thanking you for another opportunity to gather and share your word. God, I pray that whoever is listening under the sound of my voice will be blessed by your word, that they won't see me, that they will see and hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For a few minutes, I would like to share on the subject found that frustration or, as I like to say, distressed foundation. This word for this particular virtual Bible study or Bible school is frustration. Have you ever been frustrated? What does frustration look like to you? Getting ready to walk out the door and you spill something on your clothes. Did I mention you're also running late? Oh, and then you realize you didn't feel like stopping to get gas yesterday, and now you need to get gas to get to your destination. Does this cause you to be frustrated? Or let's try this one. Over the last few months, you've been diligent about eating right, maybe you even started a workout plan or at least walking. And for once, you're excited about going to the doctor for that annual physical. But instead of a clean bill of health, you're told there's an issue. Are you frustrated? Are you angry? Are you annoyed? 
How about you've worked really hard on a project at work? You're thinking promotion is around the corner, but instead you are told your department is cutting back and your position is being eliminated. How does that make you feel? How about disobedient and unruly children, unhappy spouses, broken family relationships, or broken friendships? All of this will cause us at some point to feel disappointed, defeated, and sometimes we even feel like we're not able to accomplish anything. We just can't seem to get our life together. Then you, my friend, may very well be frustrated. Frustration has been defined as a feeling of disappointment or defeat at being unable to accomplish one's purpose. Another definition that I found stated frustration originates from feelings of uncertainty and insecurity, which stems from a sense of inability to fulfill needs. If the needs of an individual are blocked, uneasiness and frustration are likely to occur. So what has you frustrated, and how do you deal with it? Frustration can also be an indication for the believer of a lack of faith and trust in God. Ouch. In our text, Jesus is teaching a parable about the wise and foolish, foolish builders. I encourage you to go back and read Matthew 7, specifically verses 21 through 23. But for time's sake, I'm just going to touch on that briefly. But it sets the stage for our text. But for now, we're focusing on verses 24 through 27. In 21 through 23, this is the parable where Jesus talks about that I never knew you and that's the only tidbit I'm going to give you. These verses, 24 through 27, are about two builders. We have the wise builder who built his house on the rock, and we have the one Jesus called foolish who built his house on the sand. We know that the rain came to both houses. It descended. The floods came. The winds blew and beat on the house, and the person who built their house on the rock their house remained, but the one who built it in the sand, their house collapsed. Some translations say it fell like a house of cards. Another translation says great was its fall. So what happened? In this parable, Jesus is teaching about people who try to take the shortcut to come to him. They may say the right things, but they aren't necessarily applying these truths to their lives. They don't do the work they don't want to do the work of a believer, so they look for the easy way out. He isn't talking about the houses that we actually live in, but he's talking about our spiritual house. What is your house built on? Those who build on sand and have knowledge but no application are, no, are not true, do not have a true or right relationship with the Lord. These people will be swept away. They look like true believers. They look like Christians. But when the storms come, their houses will, cra will crash. Maybe this is why the old preachers used to ask, do you have a right relationship with the Lord? But those who have a right relationship with the Lord, they have responded to Jesus in his word, and they know and understand the word. They realize that when the storms come, because they will, it's a part of life. But they have security in knowing their house can and will stand firm because it's built on the rock, the solid rock. So how, pray tell, will this help me to deal with my frustration? I'm so glad you asked. If you are frustrated, you have, have you checked your foundation lately? Are there cracks in your foundation? Is your foundation distressed? Is there a need for someone to come out and look and possibly repair your foundation? What type of foundation is your life built on? Is your foundation built on the solid rock or is it built in the sand? We all, we all have experienced actual storms in life, weather related and spiritual. Living in North Texas, we experience winds and hailstorms quite frequently. Right now, our neighbors to the east in Louisiana and Mississippi are dealing with the after effects of Hurricane Ida. Many times when you look at the news, you will see houses that don't have roofs. You'll see windows that have been blown completely away, furniture all over the place, but the actual physical houses still remain, unless it's a trailer home or something that's not built on a firm foundation. 
When we go through personal storms in our lives, we often see what our foundation is made of. It has been said, when going through trials and tribulations, what's in us will come out. So what do you do? Do you panic or do you start applying the word of God to your life? As believers, we can get frustrated when our plans seem to derail, but sometimes we even get angry and we get annoyed. We seem to lose our fitting. It is in times like these that we must revisit our foundation. Instead of allowing our emotions to, to control us, let me suggest you have a little talk with Jesus. You know, cast your cares on him. We should turn to our word and be reminded that he promised to never leave us or forsake us. He said in his word, no good thing will I withhold from you. We should go to his word, find a promise, and hang our head on it. To prepare for this lesson, I studied different types of foundation for houses. It was quite interesting. However, I learned there are many types of foundation, but there are actually only three basic ones the basement, the crawl space, and concrete slabs. House foundations are usually determined by the soil. So when a builder sets out to build, they have to know what kind of soil they're building on so as to put the right foundation on. Each of the foundations have pros and they have cons. Here in the DF DFW area specifically, the most common form of foundation is the concrete slab. As I said earlier, we have lots of storms here. Our roofs take a beating, but our houses usually remain standing. So in other words, foundations matter. The foundations of your spiritual matters as life matters as well. Know that hurricanes and storms will come. Hurricanes and storms of life will come too. They may come in the form of sudden trouble, inner turmoil, outside pressure. They may be financial or they may affect your health, death of a loved one. All of these storms are subject to come in your life and when they do, they definitely bring anxiety, anger, and frustration. How we respond to these storms depend on our foundation and what it is built on. I called this lesson earlier distress foundations. Distress foundations mean your foundation has a crack. You can sometimes see this on the outside of the house, especially if it's brick, or you have windows that won't close, or maybe you have cracks in your walls, uneven floors, or even misaligned doors. All of these are symptoms that are signs that there are some type of foundational issues. And when you see this happen, my advice to you would be to call someone to come out and look at it as soon as possible. Because if you don't, it will definitely continue and it eventually it will go down and you will have even more problems and it will cost a lot of money. It can be very costly. When the storms of life come, they can be costly as well. They can cause us to have distressed foundations too. The longer we go without addressing our foundational issues, the more damage we do. We walk around on the outside as if everything is okay. We look good, but on the inside, we're stressed, we're worried, our blood pressure is up, maybe we have diabetes, maybe we're anxiety, we have anxiety, heart problems. All of this is not good, and a lot of times it doesn't show on the outside, just inside. We may be doing everything we can to hold our life together, usually in and of our own strength, but honestly, we don't have that kind of strength. We weren't built for this. Thankfully, we have a Savior who can and will. A lot of times we don't address the cause of our stress, we only treat the symptoms. You know, we fix a crack here, maybe only address the door that is misaligned, but to truly correct, correct the problem, we must go underneath and check the foundation. Maybe the financial storm that came in your life came because we haven't been a good steward over our finances. Maybe the relationship storm came because we haven't our, nurtured our relationships properly. That's how you go deep to check your foundation. Fix it at the root, not just treat the symptoms. How is your foundation on today? When trouble comes, when the storms comes, do you run? Do you panic? Do you forget God and start trying to handle things on your own? 
or do you turn to him and lean on him? Do you give it over to him? If you want a firm foundation, it must be built on God's word. This means knowing and applying the word to our lives. If we don't, we're just like the foolish builder. Our lives are built on sand, and one day we will have to deal with the great fall. So again, you say, what does this foundation issue have to do with my frustrations? Again, that's, that's been what this is all about. When we get frustrated, we have to find an outlet for that frustration. And that outlet for the believer is to go to God. It's okay to go to God and tell him, I'm frustrated. Lord, I need you. Lord, help me. Lord, direct my path. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to get out of this. And a lot of times, the only word God will give you is just hold on. And that's what we are to do. As I prepare to close on this evening, I was reminded of a couple of hymns while studying this lesson. I am not a singer, so I can't sing, sing this. But the first one I thought about was how firm a foundation. And I'm just going to read two stanzas of it. It says, when through the deep waters I call you to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with you, your troubles to bless, and sanctify to you your deepest distress. When through fiery trials your pathway shall lie, my grace, all sufficient, shall be your supply. The flame shall not hurt you, I only design your dross to consume and the gold to refine. And the second one is one that I know we all know, and it's my hope is built. In the second verse of that song, it says, In every rough and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is seeking sin. So on tonight, let me encourage you that if you don't know who your hope is, who, who God is, I advise you to get to know him. I advise you first to accept him. And then if you do know him, but you're still struggling, you need to go deeper. You need to have a more intimate relationship with him. And I encourage you, when you find yourself being frustrated and going through those times where your foundation seems to be stressed, to find some scriptures to put down in your toolbox so that, you know, when you're going through, you can turn to your word. Here are some of my favorites, and I won't read the scriptures. I'm just going to give you the, I won't read the verses. I'm just going to give you the scripture. John 16, 33, Galatians 6, 9. Isaiah 41, 10, Joshua 1, 9, Proverbs 3, 6, and then my favorite, which I'm going to read, Philippians 4, 6, 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Kelso, for that awesome, encouraging word. I don't know about you, but when I heard that we were going to be talking about frustration, you know, I had the, kind of the idea in my head that we should not get frustrated. But I thank you so much, Minister Kelso, for reminding us that it is normal for us to encounter frustrations on this earth. But we have to check our foundation in such a great picture and understanding of where our foundation is, and that is in Christ Jesus. And so as we're transitioning and moving into our, our next teacher uh, for the evening, I want to kind of remind us that, you know, if you're not plugged into some form of discipleship, you're missing out. You know, there's a lot of opportunities here at the St. John Church uh, for you to stay plugged in, and not only you, but the rest of your family and friends as well. And so I'm going to kind of give you a couple of things that are going here at the church, and then, uh, then I'll finish up a little later on and give you a full few more. But I did want to share with you the Women of Victory Annual Conference that's occurring on September 11th at our South Lake campus from 9 to 3 p.m. Um, registration is now, you can go ahead and go to the website and register, and it, the registration cost is $25 uh, 
per person, per woman, amen? And so also uh, for our children and for many of us have young people in our house and uh, they have a lot of screen time, amen? Watching television, watching Netflix, watching whatever, Disney Plus. But how many of you know that the church also has resources for our young people as well? And so I wanna encourage you to go ahead. The children ministry um, is able to plug us into a weekly Bible study each week. Um, there's a QR code that you can plug into uh, that we can get to you uh, probably on, on Sunday worship. But also if you go to our website, go to that QR code. You know what, go up, open up your, uh, your app as you're, as you're on your phone click on that, and it'll send you right to that uh, Bible study. There's a lot of content through uh, YouTube that we're putting out for our children's uh, worship service each and every week that you might not be aware of uh, that'll be a blessing for you as well as your family. And so I'm going to come back here in just a minute, uh, but I want to go ahead and pass it over to Deacon Ron McClellan, who has a dynamic word for us today, um, and he's going to speak to us about kindness, all right, about kindness. We're going from frustration to kindness. Amen. Amen. It's such a pleasure to be here with each and every one of you tonight. And I thank God for this opportunity to stand and to expound upon uh, the inspirationally, divinely inspired word of God. I'm going to be walking through tonight Acts chapter 16, starting at verse number 16. And we're going to go through Acts 16, verse number 16, all the way down through verse number 34. This text is pregnant, it's loaded. Uh, for the amount of time I have, I'm going to have to microwave this text for you. I would love to put it in a crock pot and slow cook it and get all the juice and aroma out of it and let us chew on it for a while. So walk with me, run with me, and we're going to try to take this text and see what God has to say. We pray that he will cut us up, cut us down, that he will convict us, compel us, and that he will stir us along the way. It's a familiar text, and that is the text in which we find where Paul and Silas are going to be locked up. But let's start with verse number 16, 16 and 17. Once again, Acts chapter 16. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of deviation met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Verses 16 to 17, what we see right here is it happened as we went to prayer. How often are you going to prayer, that you're on your way to prayer, that you're going to your prayer closet, that you're going to call out to God, that you want to prayer, and you are somewhere or another distracted along the way, that something comes into your mind, somebody comes in, something turns you away from your time of prayer. And prayer is so important because it ushers us into the presence of God. Prayer is where we have a conversation with God. Now, let me say this here right quick, and that is many times our prayers are upside down. When I say upside down, we spend a lot of our time in prayer telling God what he already knows. God, I need this. God, let me tell you this. God, help me with this. God, this. God, that. As if God's an errand boy. And we spend all that time telling God what he, what he already knows, and it is all about us and what we stand in need of, rather than asking God, Lord, help me to love you the way you've asked me to love you. Help me to be the servant. Asking God, what is it you want me to do for you today? Lord, speak to me that my spirit may line up with your words, your will in your way. So that's what I mean when I say a lot of times we spend our time in prayer upside down telling God all about what he already knows. And listen, if I was to, to, to spend the day with Oprah Winfrey and I get out of the car at the end of the day and I tell somebody, I was with Oprah all day. Somebody say, well, let me ask you this. Did you ask her about Stedman? Did you ask her about this? Did you ask her about that? And I say, no, but I told her this and I told her that. And they say, you spent all that time with Oprah and you didn't ask Oprah about anything? But, her, but told her all about yourself, we want to know about Oprah. So when you go to God in prayer, ask God about God rather than spending all that time telling God what he already knows about yourself. But nonetheless, they were on their way to prayer. And, and the enemy came along the way, and a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of deviation met us. This girl was possessed. She had a spirit of deviation, and she brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. Now, in verse number 17, it says, This girl followed Paul and us and 
cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And she did this many days. As they were on their way, this girl met them, and she cried out, These men, now she's speaking truth for the most part. These men are the servants of the Most High God. That was true. The enemy will speak truth, and at the same time will have an undertone and a current of that which is untrue. These men are the servants of the Most High God, that's true, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And she did this many days. Now, what we have here is she's proclaiming to be the truth. People know that, that, that she has a spirit of deviation. If Paul was to allow her to continue to walk with them, sooner or later somebody would perhaps tie into the fact, well, she's a Christian. She lines up with them. They accept her. They accept what she's doing. They have no problem with her. And that's not the case because she had a spirit of deviation. She was not a child of God. She was not a Christian. And Paul recognized this. And finally, Paul says here in verse number uh, uh, 18, he says, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And, and, she, and about that same hour, that very hour, the spirit came out. But her masters saw, in verse number 18, that their hope and profit was gone. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to their authorities. Now, that Paul was annoyed at this spirit. He commanded this spirit, in the name of Jesus, come out of her. Let me say this, my brothers and sisters. Be careful how and who you are if you're going to command a spirit to come out of somebody or if you're going to command anything in the name of Jesus. Say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Listen, we remember the seven sons of Sceva. If not, let me remind you about the seven sons of Sceva. Sceva had seven sons, and he was aware of the fact that Paul was casting out demons that were in individual. He was aware of the, they were aware of the fact that Jesus had cast out demons. And there was this demon-possessed man, and the seven sons of Sceva ran into the house, and they go cast this demon out of this man. And they said, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of this man. And the demon-possessed man said, now Paul I know, and Jesus I know, but you, I don't know who you are. And the demon jumped on the, pe the seven sons of Sceva, beat them up, blooded them, ran out of the house naked. Here they come running out of the house, bleeding and naked, proclaiming that they know Jesus Christ. If you know Jesus Christ, you have power. But if you don't know Jesus Christ, don't be shaking and faking, my brothers and sisters. Many times we think we're something that we're not. Listen, one morning I got up, I went in the closet, I got dressed, I put on a black shirt, I put on a black pair of pants, I walked out, my wife was sitting there in the sitting room, she said, oh, look, the man in black, the man in black. I said, yeah, I got my black on today. I got my black shirt, I got my black pants, I got my black shoes. I get to the office real early, it's dark, nobody's there yet. I go in my office, I close my door, I work for a good while, finally I come out, my administrative assistant's right there, and she says, oh, that's Johnny Cash, the man in black. I said, yeah, I got my black shirt, I got my black pants, I got my black shoes. About noon, I go out to get something to eat. And when I step out into the sun, S-U-N, but there's also an S-O-N. When I stepped out into the sun, the sun shined on me, and I realized at that very moment, I had some navy blue pants on. I thought I was something that I was not. I thought I was the man in black. My brothers and sisters, even as I'm talking right now, there's somebody that thinks their, their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. There's somebody that thinks Jesus is Lord and Savior of their life, and you're shaking and breaking. As Jesus says, many of you will come to me that day, and you will say, I did this and I did that in your name, and Jesus will say, depart from me. Listen, if you don't get nothing else that I say tonight, make sure you're a child of Jesus Christ. Make sure your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Make sure you've accepted him as Lord and Savior. Make sure you love him. Make sure he's Lord of your life. That is so important that he's Lord. If he's Lord, what he, what he tells you to do, you would do it, because he is Lord and Savior and Redeemer of your life. If nothing else that I say tonight, make sure you're a true child of the God and that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. But now let me get back to the text, my brothers and sisters. We get back, and it says in verse 19, but after he had cast the demons out of the man, out of the man he says, but out of the woman, I'm sorry, out of the woman, but when her master saw 
that her hope, that their hope of profit was gone. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before their authorities. They saw that their way of making money was gone. Listen, they didn't rejoice over the fact that the woman had, had been uh, delivered from the demons. What is it that we rejoice over, my brothers and sisters? Do we rejoice over that which God edifies and glorifies? Or do we get down and out when perhaps our way of making money has been taken away from us? Here we are in a COVID-19 situation, and we're dealing with being locked up. We're dealing with layoffs. We're dealing with problems as far as our finances go. And perhaps God says, I want to park you for a while. I want to park you on the sideline so that you can hear my voice. I want to give you a time out so that you can go into your prayer closet, so that you can spend time in my Word, study and grow closer to me. Do we worry about the money or we say, Lord, this is a time that I can draw nigh unto you, that I can call out unto you, that I can hear your voice. They were so concerned that they had lost their means of income that they wanted to now to have Paul and Silas persecuted over the, rather than rejoicing over the deliverance of this woman. My brothers and sisters, always rejoice. Rejoice when you see God's hand move, no matter what it might have to do with your finances, no matter no matter what it might bring in the way of discomfort in your life, but rejoice over the fact when you see God magnified and glorified in somebody's life. Let me keep on walking through this text. We jump down to verse number 20, and they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews, there you go, there you go right there. They bring them because they, and they, they charge them of the fact says, these men being Jews, anti-Semitic, listen, Prejudice has been around, my brothers and sisters, for years and years and years. And we as people of color know more about it than anybody. And here they bring up the fact that these men are Jews. They didn't say, just say these men. And that's why we see as Paul and Silas. Listen, Timothy was around with them at that same time. Timothy was a half Gentile. That's why they didn't have a problem. Luke was around. G Luke was a Gentile. That's why they didn't have a problem. But these men, being Jews, exceedingly troubled our city. They are causing us problems, they say. Verse number 21, and they teach us customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans to receive or observe. Once again, that is a truth. First of all, it's a truth and it's a lie. They wasn't troubling these men. They wasn't troubling the people at all. All they had did was deliver this woman from this evil spirit. Now, what is true is this here. They teach us customs that are not lawful. It wasn't lawful for them to bring a religion in there of Christianity. Listen, Christianity is not accepted in a lot of places, my brothers and sisters. Fortunately, we are in a country where we can share our beliefs. But how many of us are concerned about what might happen? We might anger someone. We might turn them off. We might get them up. Set. How many times can we go to our job and we keep Christ to ourselves? We don't share Christ with somebody. Listen, my brothers and sisters, God wants you to be Joseph in Potiphar's house. He needs and desires for you to be Joseph in Potiphar's house. Well, you say, Brother Ron, what do you mean about being Joseph in Potiphar's house? I'm so glad you asked. I am so glad. That is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful question. What does that look like being Joseph in Potiphar's house? Well, let me tell you what it looks like. Joseph was in Potiphar's house, and Potiphar saw that everything Joseph put his hands through, that his God blessed. And because of that, Potiphar said, I'm turning everything over to you, Joseph, because I see that everything that you do, your God blessed. It says that Potiphar did not know of what he had, only the bread that was in his house. And what that says to us is, all Potiphar knew was how, the amount of bread that he has in his house. Other than that, Joseph was in charge of everything. Now, the question that you ask is, well, how did Potiphar know that everything Joseph did, his God blessed? That's because Joseph gave God the glory for everything he did. Every time somebody said, Joseph, how were you able to do this? Because my God is able. Joseph, how? Because I prayed. Joseph, how did you? Because I give God the glory and the praise. Every time somebody asked Joseph how, he said, my God, my God, my God. God. My brothers and sisters, when you are at work and somebody says you did a good job, how were you able to do it? Say, my God, to God be the glory, to God be the praise. What I'm saying, my brothers and sisters, is every opportunity you get, no matter when that pat 
comes on the back. No matter when that praise comes, give God the glory. Give God the praise. When I'm in the checkout line and they swipe that debit card, I say, praise the Lord. And somebody says, oh, come on, Brother Ron. You knew you had enough money to pay for a Tic Tac. I don't know that. Somebody could have done something and stole my identity and took every little dime and nickel I had in my pocketbook. But all I'm saying is, my brothers and sisters, be Joseph in Potiphar's house. And that is give God the glory that everyone around you, in your workplace, in your community, everybody knows that you're a child of a God and that everything you do comes from Him and Him alone. Sorry for that station identification. Let me get back to the text. I was where? Then the multitude rose against them. And the mag let me pick it up at verse number 21. And they teach customs. Verse 21. I'm getting back to it. Verse 21. They teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to observe. Verse 22. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. Verse 23. And when they had laid, hand, laid many stripes on them, they threw them into the prison, commanded the jailer to keep them securely. The multitude rose against them. A crowd came up against them, my brothers and sisters. And the magistrates, those which were in authority, tore their clothes. That's how angry they get. They tore their garments, my brothers and sisters. In other words, they ripped off their garments. They just didn't sit there behind perhaps a stool or a desk and say, okay, okay, okay. No, 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 no. They were angry, angry, angry because they were spreading the gospel. I'm saying, my brothers and sisters, you're going to anger somebody by sharing the Word of God. All you want to do, all you want to do when you share the Word of God, you don't want to get caught up in a lot of politics, my brothers and sisters. Just stay on Jesus Christ. When you're sharing the Word, stay on Jesus Christ. I learned this a long time ago. You can talk about God, you can say God this and God that, and people in your work arena, people in your community, even people in your house will agree with you when they say, yes, God is this and God is that. But as quickly as you can, Drop Jesus Christ on the table. You say, well, why is that, Brother Ron? Because you cannot get to God without going through Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the way. Except by him, you cannot get to God. And so what I'm saying, my brothers and sisters, as quickly, as quickly as you can, drop Jesus Christ on the table. And if they pick him up the same way you believe in him, then you know you're all right. But if they don't pick him up the same way, if they say, time out, time out, Brother Ron, what do you mean about Jesus? I don't believe all that about Jesus Christ. I believe that about God. Stay with Jesus in the conversation. Don't go back to God because your job at that point, your mission, at that point is to get that brother or to get that sister to Jesus Christ. Now, the magistrates tore their clothes, and they commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them in prison, commanded the jailer, verse number 23, the jailer to keep them securely. Now, check this out. Check this out. And when they had laid many stripes on them, Mmm, many stripes on them. They had beaten them with many stripes, beat them down. They threw them into the prison, commanded the jailer to keep them secure, locked them up, beat them. Listen, only what you do for God will last. This is a temporary scenario, and we're going to look at a text in just a moment that will help us to understand that. They were beaten, they were locked up, and then the jailer was, turned, was telling them, said, throw them, commanded them into the innermost place. Verse 24, having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Jailer felt at this time, I've got them where I want them, I've got them where I need them, they're locked up. And the jailer even went home next door, close by, going to get him some rest. But at midnight, whoo, you can have some strange experiences at midnight. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. They were praying and singing, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone, everyone's chains were loosened. Let me walk through this just for a moment. At midnight, 
They were praying and singing. Now, when this all started out, they were on their way to prayer. When the, the girl with the deviation showed up, they were on their way to prayer. Here they are now, beaten, locked up in, the, in an uncomfortable situation. But they are not saying, woe is me. They're not saying, where is God? They're not cussing and fussing. They are praying and singing and giving God praise. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And the prisoners were listening. My brothers and sisters, when you're in a situation that appears to be a dire strait, where you should be angry, where you should be fussing. Silas didn't look at Paul and said, this is a fine mess you got me in. And Paul didn't look at Silas and said, no, you started this. I shouldn't have listened to you. Then Paul, Silas didn't say, I had no business following you. No, 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 no. They on the same page. One's praying, one singing, one singing, another praying. Giving God the praise. But all the prisoners are listening. And what I'm saying, my brothers and sisters, other people around you, other people in your community, other people in your job, other people in your house are watching and looking at how do you handle the difficult situations in your life. Do you fall apart? You claim to be a child of God. You claim that your God has power. You claim that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You claim that through all things, God will bless me. You claim that. But when the storms of life rise up, when things start getting difficult, do you stand fast to God? Do you give him glory? Do you give him praise? That's what's going on in the jailhouse. They're giving God glory, and they're giving God praise. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. They're praising his holy name. And all the prisoners are listening. This is having a profound effect. They're saying, how can them two fellas sit there and praise God in spite of what's going on in their life. Because they say, that God must be somebody. And then suddenly there was a great earthquake. Suddenly there was a great earthquake. So that the foundation of the prison was shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened. And everyone's chains were loosened. Everyone, every prisoner in the prison house, chains were loosened. Listen, there's another example of this. When Peter was locked up, there was another prayer meeting. There was a prayer meeting going on at the house, and it says many saints were praying for Peter, and an angel showed up, and the angel walked in, and Peter was between two guards, and he had two chains on him. Peter was in a likewise situation, except he hadn't taken the beating that Paul and Silas had taken. But here, an angel shows up. In Paul and Silas's situation, there was a great earthquake. God is showing that I can use supernatural, meaning an angel, and I can use the natural, meaning an earthquake, to perform my miracle work in power of setting people free. God can perform a supernatural act in your life, and he can use the natural resources of this world also to open things up. But when Peter was set free and he went to where the prayer meeting was, the girl showed up, looked out, and said, there's Peter, who we've been praying for, ran back into the house and said, Peter's at the door. And everybody said, you done lost your mind. Why is it we don't expect a miracle from God when we're praying? When you're praying and asking for God for a miracle, expect a miracle. Be looking for a miracle. Turn every day and say, where is my miracle? If God doesn't bless you and deliver you in this life, in this world, he's going to bless you and deliver you in the next world. He'll either deliver you in or out of your situation. But one thing you can bank on, God will deliver you. Let's keep walking through the text, my brothers and sisters sisters. They said they were set free. Everybody was set free. Woo, everybody. Now, these jailhouse fellas, these prisoners, they had heard them singing and praying, and all of a sudden, the great earthquake came, and now they say, we are set free. They know also the results, because they had heard these two fellas. They said, only this guy, these individuals, God, could have done what has happened, because that's a testimony that they heard. Everyone's chains were loose in verses number 27 and 28. And the keeper of the prison awakened from his sleep. Now, this guy is not in the prison because he went home. And we're also going to find out where his whole house is saved. So we know he had went home, laid down, got comfortable, and he was awakened because the very foundation of the prison had been shaken and everything about around it. The prisoners were awakened. Now, he says, and the keeper of the prison 
prison, waking from his sleep and seeing the prisoners' doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called out with a loud voice, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Hmm. Then he called, with a, called for a light and ran and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Now, this is an individual that perhaps was also part of the beating. If he was not part of the beating process, he was a part of the lockup process, meaning I'm locking you two fellas up, and I ain't letting you get out for nothing because if I let you go, I'm going to be killed. But all of a sudden, look what has changed in his life because of the miracle working power of God and because of the steadfast faith of Paul and Silas, because what he had witnessed in the life of Paul and Silas— he called for a light, and he brought it to them. He said, sir, what must I do to be saved? This is the greatest thing that's going on in the entire text. What must I do to be saved? Our mission in this war, my brothers and sisters, we are in a spiritual war. We're not wrestling with flesh and blood, but we're wrestling with powers and principalities, rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness. We're soldiers in the army of God. Don't expect every day to be a hallelujah boulevard day. Expect to get cut. Expect to be downtrodden. Expect to be talked about. Expect to be persecuted. Expect rough things. Expect difficulties. Why? Because we're in a war. That's why what war where there's every day hallelujah and la, 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 and joy and happiness. No, 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 no. War is bitter and war is difficult, and that's what's going on. But our mission, my brothers and sisters, our goal, our desire is to recruit and bring others to the throne of Jesus Christ. And that's what's happening in this episode. The jailer says, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? If you can spend your day, one day, and at the end of that day, have one person come to you and say, brother, sister, what must I do to be saved? That's a glorious hallelujah day. That's our goal. That's our desire as servants of the Most High God. I'm about to finish up here because my time is getting away from me. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? They spoke a word. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in verse number 31 and you will be saved. Jesus Christ. I said earlier, my brothers and sisters, when you share the gospel, share Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. I know we want to talk about God. I know we want to talk about the goodness of God. But before you can get a person to God, you got to get them to Jesus Christ. Believe on Jesus Christ. And he says, and you will be saved, you and your household. I want everybody in my house to have the names on the Lamb's Book of Life. Brothers and sisters, pray in the not yet. You may have some grandchildren that have not been birthed into this world yet. You may have some great-grandchildren that have not been birthed into this world yet. Pray in the not yet. And what I'm saying is pray for that unborn grandchild. Pray for that unborn uh, great-grandchild. Lord, bless my grandchild. Bless my great-grandchild. Bless their husband. Bless their wife, even though they haven't been born yet. Why? Because Satan is already in the not yet, my brothers and sisters. And we got to pray in the not yet, meaning that Satan says, Yes, Ron, your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. Yes, Ron, you're saved. Yes, your sons are. But there's some unborn grandchildren that have not come into this world. Satan is in the night yet, and he's seeking my unborn grandchildren if they ever come into this world, and I'm praying for them now. So what I'm encouraging each and every one of you to do is to pray into the night yet, my brothers and sisters, and let's keep walking through the text. And he says, and their whole household was saved. Then they spoke the word unto the Lord to him, and to all who were in the house, all in the house. And he took that same hour of the night, and he washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Immediately. Wasn't no thinking about it. Wasn't no considering it. Wasn't no talking about it. Immediately they were baptized. Now when he had brought them into the house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced. He having believed in God with all his household. Brother ain't worried about it anymore. He ain't worried about being locked up. 
meaning the jailer. The jailer ain't worried about being killed. He's not taking a sword out to kill himself. He's rejoicing because now his name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. He's not worried about what's going to happen from the magistrates when they show up. And when you see the magistrates show up later on in the text, now they're saying they let them go. They ain't even worried about the jailer. The jailer doesn't have to worry about what man is going to do now because Jesus is his Lord and Savior and Redeemer. Let me say this here. I said earlier, turn to 2 Corinthians, my brothers and sisters, chapter 4, verse number 17 and 18. 2 Corinthians, turn real quick. Turn real quick with me to 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. Let me hunker this off real quick. My time is getting away. It says right here in 2 Corinthians 17 and 18, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Yes, we're going to go through some persecution. Yes, we're going to have some difficult times. Yes, there's going to be some unpleasant things in our life. Lord says, listen, every day is not going to be a halle, halle, boulevard day. You're going to have trials and tribulations. But look what this text says. Our light affliction... Whatever comes your way, my brothers and sisters, whatever discomfort we have, if it's a layoff, if it's pains and aches in your body, if it's a loved one doing you wrong, listen, sometimes things happen in church. We want to stay away from church when people talk about us, when something goes wrong in church, when we don't get on the program like we wish we should have, when we don't get the accolades laid on our back and the applause and the recognition like we think we should. Whatever, it turns us off, and I don't want to go to church anymore. I don't want to go to work because they gossip about me. Or my husband, or my wife. God says whatever happens to you in this world, it is a light affliction, light Light, we can handle it. It's light, but not only is it light, check this out. It is but for a moment. But for a moment, it's not going to last long. But this is what that affliction is doing that's just for a moment. It's working for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. Hallelujah to God for the affliction, for whatever it might be. While we do not loathe for the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're experiencing, whatever's happening in your life, it's temporary. But the things which are eternal, which are not seen, they are eternal, that which is not seen. Eternal. Heaven is my home. If it is eternal, there is no time in heaven. There's no sun. There's no moon because God is the light. His glory lights up all of heaven. There is no clock. When you look in Revelation 1, an angel steps one foot on land, one foot on water, and says time will be no more. It's eternal, my brothers and sisters. That is our goal. Heaven is our home. Don't worry about the light affliction. Don't worry about what's going on in your life today. Serve God in this spiritual war. Serve the Most High and Mighty God. Then I want us to turn real quick to Romans 5. Romans 5, and I want to walk through verses 3 and 5 because my time is about to get away from me here. Walk, to, walk with me. Romans 5, verses 3 and through 5. But we also glory in tribulation. Glory in it. Glory in it. That's why Paul and Silas were able to sing. Were able to sing and pray in tribulation. Whatever's going in your life, Glory in it. Give God the glory in the place, especially when you're being persecuted for serving the Lord. Verses 3 and 5 in Romans. But we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character and character hope. These are all the blessings that come through persecution. Now, hope does not disappoint. Keep hope alive, as they say. Keep hope alive. That is so wonderful to say. Why? Why keep hope alive? Because, the text says, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given to us. Because the love of God, hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out in our... How could Paul and Silas love this jailer who is part of the beating that they had received? How could they love his family? How could they love everybody that has done them wrong? How can you love people that persecute you? You can say, and don't do this. 
Well, God made me. God knows how I am. God does it. God will excuse me if I cuss him out for a moment. God will understand because, you know, listen, this is who I am. No, 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 no. No, you're not that. You have to appropriate the love of God that is in you. God has placed it in you. It flows all through you. Let me give you this demonstration right quick. Check this out. Listen, we have this glass here, and then we have this cup of milk. And when we were conceived, my brothers and sisters, we were poured into flesh and blood. And when we were poured into flesh and blood, we were conceived in sin, and we were shaped in iniquity. And because of that, we wasn't pure milk. We wasn't pure white. We had a, a taint. There was something tainted about us. And if you can see this cup or this glass, you can say, well, it started out, but when it was poured in, it was conceived in sin and shaped in iniquity. And for some reason, it's not as pure and clean as we thought. That's why our babies, we say, ain't they so cute and nice? But then they'd grow up, and for some reason, we say, well, they're just little devils. But later on, along the way, when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Redeemer, when your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you have a new nature, and things change, and things turn around, all of a sudden, that which was unholy, all of a sudden, that which was wicked, all of a sudden, that which caused you to behave a manner in which you shouldn't have, somehow or another, it is gone away. It is drowned. It is absorbed. And people say, oh, wait a minute. Now, I remember when you were a drug dealer and a drug addict. That was me. Wait a minute. Now, I know when you were a cussing sailor. That was me. Wait a minute. Now, I know when you didn't have respect for any. That was me. But then they say all of a sudden, what is it about you, Brother Ron? They say something's been poured in you. That's the Spirit of God. It has been poured into me, and all of a sudden, I am a new creature. But then trouble comes along. Hard times come along. Somebody perhaps steps on my toes and offends me, and all of a sudden, things get a little shaky and something spills out of me. Now you ask yourself, why did chocolate milk spill out of the glass? Some may say because, Ron, you were shaking the glass. No, 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 no. What I'm saying, my brothers and sisters, trials and tribulations going to come your way. Disruptions are going to come your way. And when that happens, something's going to spill out. But what I ought to spill out is the love of God. Why? Because I'm full of the love of God by way of the Spirit of God. It is God's Spirit that's in me, that's pouring His love out of me. Because if if it was the old Ron, I would say, excuse me while I give this person a piece of my mind. But instead of doing that, there's a Paul and Silas moment where I'm singing, praying, praising, and giving God all the glory, and all of a sudden somebody says, I want a little bit of what you got, and that's the Holy Spirit that's dwelling in me. To God be the glory. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Amen and amen. Ron, what a wonderful message. And you might wonder, what did that have to do with kindness? Well, I'm here today to tell you that that was a powerful lesson on true kindness because true kindness comes from what's on the inside and is in spite of the things that we go through within our life. Uh, the title uh, that Deacon Ron actually had was Turning Persecution into Production. How many know that God can use your pain? He can use your peril, and he can do, use the trials that you're going through right now to his glory. You know, it's not enough to say the devil did made me do it or Let's see what you made me do because you got me angry. I'm here today to tell you, just like Deacon Ron said with that milk and that chocolate milk and that strawberry milk, is that whatever you put on the inside, right, is what's going to come out on the outside when we become agitated. And so I don't know about you, but I was blessed by that word. Just like our pastor said, there's only one thing that's better than one word from the Lord, and that's two words from the Lord. And we heard two fantastic words from Minister Kelso as well as Deacon Ron. And if you, yeah, we actually do have a live studio audience. You hear those claps going forth. Amen. Amen. I want you to go ahead and put your hands together in the chat as well. Put those clap emojis together for what we have experienced and how we have been blessed by these two 
awesome teachers of the Word of God. And I believe there was some preaching going on as well. Amen. And so I will be, uh, I will be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity. Uh, we shared so much about the foundation of Christ and also the operation of the Holy Spirit within our lives and how it's a clear foundation of who we are and how we get through this thing called life. And so I'll be remiss if I did not share the gift of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so right now, even where you are right now, you might not even be watching this on live. You might be streaming this later on. Somebody might have sent this to you. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to do some inventory right now. The scripture teaches us in Romans 10, 9, that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe within our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Yes, you shall be saved. And yes, there, we all used to be a lot of things, right? But we are not our sin. We don't have to be the identity of those labels that many of us have. And you can have a new identity in Christ Jesus. And so right now, if you would like to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that's the first invitation, that I, invitation to Christ. Or if you know in your heart that God is calling you to become a member of a church right now, a member of a community, uh, there's an invitation up for a community that I'm extending to you right now. And so as you're watching online, if you're even watching on the website, I want to encourage you to go to our website if you're watching on Facebook and go to pick one of the various locations, whether it be South Lake, uh, Grand Prairie, or virtual, and at the top of the page there, I want you to hit that join button. Hit that join button, and we want to reach out to you and walk with you. If you're, if you're looking to accept Christ, or if you're looking to, uh, to be obedient to God's word and not forsake the assembling of the brethren, we want to go ahead and partner with you and reach out to you so that we can walk with you. Amen. And so I'm going to go ahead and pray and lift up those decisions real quick as we look to the Lord in prayer. Lord, how we thank you uh, for this word that's went forth, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for the invitation, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that you're still calling us, Father God. And we pray, Lord, that you would just touch those, Lord, who uh, touch the ears of those who have received this word, Lord, that we would have the audacity to be different, Father God, and change uh, our activities and change our actions, Father God. And most of all, those who do not know you in the pardoning of their sin, they do not have a relationship with Christ Jesus, will be moved to action, even right now, Lord, that they will, uh, before they log off, Lord, that they will hit that, that join button, and they will accept you, and they will uh, walk with us, Lord, as we walk with you, Father God. We thank you. We honor you, Father God, that you are God who multiplies, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. And so I want to, before we get out of the way, I want to make sure that we take care of the business of the church. And uh, if you are a member of the church, uh, this is a great opportunity for, your, to, for you to pour into your ministry uh, with tithes and offerings. And so right now, right where you are, there are a number of ways that you can pay your tithes or give an offering through GiveLify, uh, through PayPal, many of those things that we're going to put up here on the screen here in just a second, or the traditional way, you can go ahead and mail your, uh, your tithes to the P.O. box that's on the screen right now. But I want to go ahead and encourage you, if you're not a member of this church, it is always appropriate and good to sow into good soil. And so we welcome you. If you want to partner with us, we're doing some awesome things here at the St. John Church, virtually and even in person. And if you're ever in the area and you want to worship with us, we are worshiping in person uh, on Sundays, amen, every single Sunday at 7 and 9 o'clock at our Grand Prairie campus, and also at 10 o'clock at our South Lake location. But amen. We, we welcome all membership. We welcome all attendance, whether that's virtually or in person. And we pray that you will uh, join us next Tuesday and Wednesday or on tomorrow we'll be broadcasting this message again. And you, it could be a blessing to you or to somebody else. Amen. As we share the gifts of the, of the gospel. And it's been a wonderful time as we've gone through Vacation Bible School, just a little bit different, right? We're used to the traditional Vacation Bible School. We're coming together, singing songs, and gathering. But guess what? God is blessing us even through this process of having Vacation Bible School virtually. And as we've talked about the various emotions, one thing has been the paramount topic between all of these topics is we've talked about anger. We've talked about frustration. We've talked about kindness. We've talked about adversity. We understand and recognize that we serve a God who is bigger than any of those emotions that sometimes plague us and drive us, right? And we serve a God who's a God of all comfort and peace. So whatever you're struggling with, whatever you're dealing with, we want to make sure that we push, put it all in God's hands. So with that, I want to encourage you right now, if you are in need of prayer, if you are in need of prayer, we would love to pray with you. 
there's a tab, just like I said, go to one of our church locations, either virtual, Grand Prairie, or South Lake, and hit the prayer button. And so we want to reach out to you, pray with you, and partner with you, and uh, uh, just be and to minister with you. And so whatever that might be, uh, we have a prayer call every single week on, uh, that, that we get on. And so we want to lift you up as well as add you to our pastoral care list. Amen. And so as, as we go, I want to go ahead and pray over those offerings that we have given through the various means. Amen. And then we're going to go ahead and get out of here. And we're going to say farewell, but not goodbye. We want to make sure that you stay plugged in to the St. John Church through the various means, through social media, our website. And be sure to share the gospel by hitting that share button. Amen. And so as we go, let's look to the Lord. Gracious Father God, we thank you. We honor you, Father God, for what you're doing in this church, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for our pastor, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for these uh, ministers, Father God, who shared the gospel, Father God, on tonight. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to just have your way, regardless if we're in this physical space or in the virtual space, Father God. We understand that your word reigns supreme, Father God. And Father God, we pray, Lord, that we will be like that chocolate milk, Lord, that whenever we encounter life circumstances, Lord, whatever spills out, is kindness. And whatever spills out, Father God, brings glory to your name, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen. And praise God. Have a great week.